This morning, we're going to conclude our series that's been a little chopped up uh, called Planted, which is from the parable that Jesus told in the Gospels, uh, the parable of the sower. And uh, last week, Pastor Brandon talked about the third seed. But you remember the parable where Jesus uh, t- tells the story about a farmer went out and sowed seeds. And the seeds fell, remember, on four different um, soils or four different environments, the footpath and then the rocky soil. Some fell among thorns and then some fell on good soil. And you know, a parable is an earthly story with a spiritual meaning. And so when Jesus told this parable, he was trying to give us some revelation, some insight onto how this kingdom, how the kingdom of God works. And and remember, Jesus explains the meaning of the parable, and he said the seed represents the word of God. The sower represents God himself, right? And so he says um, that the former sowed the seeds, the Lord sowed the seeds, The seed that was sown represents the word of God and the soil represents different people, different hearts of people and how they receive the word of God. And he talks about these four different kinds of people. And whenever you think about it, you and I could fit in any one of these seeds. This could represent us. In in last week, you know, Pastor Brandon talked about that third seed that fell among thorns. And it says in Luke 8, 14, the seeds that fell among the thorns represent those who hear the message, but all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life. And so they never grow into maturity. And so God just doesn't just want us to be a Christian. God wants us to mature. He wants us to be mature Christians so that we can, we can, uh, we can survive the trials and tribulations of life. But if you never grow mature, you're going to be easily defeated. You're going to be easily discouraged. And so we have to mature. Amen. And so Pastor Brandon brought out the three barriers to grow in spiritually, the worry of the world. If you worry about everything around you and you don't focus on the Lord, it's going to hinder you. Then the barrier of the deceitfulness of wealth. Some people give up their Christianity chasing another dollar. And then the passing pleasures of life. Some people don't have time for God because they're too busy having fun. But you'll never grow to maturity unless you deal with the barriers that keep you from maturing. Can I get an amen? Now, today we're going to talk about the fourth seed, which I'm calling the producers. Amen. And in Matthew 13, 8, it says, still other seeds fell on fertile soil and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even a hundred times as much as had been planted. So the fourth seed, Jesus said, was planted in good soil and it represents the spiritual fruit producers. And that's the goal the Lord has for every one of us, right? Spiritual producers producers is what God desires and has intended for every Christian. In fact, in John 15, 16, he said, you didn't choose me. Did you know that, that you didn't decide to serve the Lord? The Lord drew you by his spirit. Thank God for that. Amen. He said, you didn't choose me. I chose you and I appointed you to go and produce fruit that will last. God wants us to produce, and he wants us to produce lasting fruit. The Lord called, anointed, and appointed you and I to be fruit bearers. Amen. Remember when Jesus was was uh, walking out of Bethany, and he was going to the next city to minister, and the Bible says he was hungry. Jesus was hungry. And he walks up to a fig tree. He's going to pick some figs to eat. And he goes up to the fig tree and he looks on one side, no figs. He looks on the other side, no figs. He looks around the tree, there's no figs. And he curses the fig tree. Why did he curse the fig tree? Because he was expecting fruit on the tree. And I believe it's the same way with us. God is expecting us to be fruit producers, saints of God. Come on, I need a better amen than that. Amen. And so 
What does a spiritual fruit producer look like? What does a productive Christian look like? I want to unfold that a little bit because I think whenever just the abstract thought of being a fruit producer sometimes doesn't resonate with us to really know what that's like. And so let me talk about it. There are three signs of spiritually productive Christians. Number one is a productive Christian demonstrates the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Somebody that's born again, somebody that's Christian is born of the Spirit and therefore should produce spiritual fruit. Galatians 5.22 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we call ourselves Christian, we should have spiritual fruit in our life. Amen. And so here's what it looks like. A productive Christian demonstrates the love of God, the joy of the Lord, the peace of God in their life. A productive Christian displays the fruit of peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's what it's, we're supposed to look like. In fact, in other words, a spiritually productive Christian lives a life controlled by the Holy Spirit instead of being controlled by their flesh. See, we're not supposed to be fleshly controlled. As children of God, we're supposed to be spirit controlled. A non-productive Christian lives a life characterized by the works of their flesh. In Galatians 5.19, the scripture gives us a, a picture of fleshly living. The deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this. This is what a fleshly driven person looks like. And that's not supposed to be you and I. You believe that this morning? If you do, help me preach and say, amen. amen. So you see, a spiritually productive Christian is one who learns how to crucify and deny his flesh and walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And so a second sign of a spiritually productive Christian is a productive Christian effectively, effectively administer God's grace to others. And so, you know, uh, you know what that means is that a spiritually productive Christian touches other people, encourages other people, Loves up on other people. It's a blessing to those around them. You know what fruit is? Fruit is excessive life. And as a Christian, we have the life of God in us. And we should have an, access, an excess of it where we go around blessing others around us. Amen. In other words, they're focused on serving others instead of being self-serving. Their heart is to serve and minister to other people around them. Whenever you're a non-productive Christian, you, you could care less about other people. It's just you and, and you just don't care. But if we're going to be a productive Christian, which God appointed us to be, then we have to be about other people and adding value to them, encouraging them, loving them, and strengthening them. Amen? First Peter 4.10 says, Each one should do whatever, uh, use whatever gift he has received to serve others faithfully, administering God's grace in various forms. In Acts 1.8, it says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the utmost parts. See, the reason the Lord gave us the Holy Spirit is so we can act like a Christian in the front of other people. And other people will see our testimony and say, I want to live my life like that. I want my life to mirror that person's life because they seem more peaceful. They seem to be full of control and, and they seem to just be able to not be stirred up and, and overcome by every little trial and tribulation they go through. I want to be like that. Come on, are y'all with me out there? That's how the Lord begins to encourage others to come into the kingdom. So the reason the Lord gives us the spirit is to be productive Christians. Amen. The third sign of a productive Christian is a productive Christian lives a happy, prosperous, and victorious life. 
You know, like the abundant life. In 1 John 5, 4, it says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. See, a productive Christian, they conquer their problems instead of being conquered by their problems. A victorious Christian, they overcome the trials and tribulations of their life instead of being overcome by the trials and tribulations of their life. They defeat the giants of their, in their life instead of being defeated by the giants of their life. Amen. And so listen, a spiritually productive Christian who is one who lives an overcoming and a victorious kind of life. They're happy. They're prosperous. They're blessed. They're, they're, they're loving the every day that God God gives them because they know it's a privilege and an honor to be a child of God living on this earth, serving him and being one of his children. Amen. That's the kind of life the Lord wants us to live. He wants us to live a productive life. And, you know, whenever I look at that, whenever I look at those four seeds and I look at the one that was planted in good soil, I'm thinking, you know, listen, even in the midst of the craziness We've experienced in the last six months here in America. I want you to know, my friend, you can still overcome. You can still have peace. You can still have joy. You can still live a victorious, blessed, prosperous kind of life. Why? Because you've got the power of God living on the inside of you that raises you up above every circumstance and situation that you're living in. Amen. So how do you live that kind of life, right? How do you live that kind of life? How do you live a spiritually productive life? Well, we get the answer right here in the parable. And in verse 15, in Luke 8, 15, and the seeds that fell on good soil represents honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word, cling to it, and patiently produce a huge harvest. So in this one verse, Jesus gives us three secrets to live in the kind of life we just described. And the first secret is this. You live a life of sincerity and integrity. And so in, in verse 15, he says, the seed that fell on good soil represents honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word. Remember, the seed represented God's word, but the soil represents the hearts of people. And he said, the seed that produced fruit is the people. Everybody heard the word. Everybody was exposed to the word. Not everybody came out the same way by being exposed to the word. You got to have a good heart. Amen. Jesus says the soul represents honest, good hearted, pure hearted, sincere hearted kind of people. So listen, if you want the word of God to transform your life, you have to have a good, honest, pure and sincere heart. And, and, you know, I love the James 1 21 says, get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and, and humbly accept the word of God that's planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your soul. So James says, you got to get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives. So you see, some people come to church and they hear the word. And they, they say, oh, man, that was so encouraging. The next person leaves and says, I didn't get anything out of that. Well, it may be that you're hanging on to some filth. It may be because you're hanging on to some evil. Same people heard the same words. Somebody gets blessed by it. Somebody does it. you got to get the sorrow right. Come on, you got to get your heart right. Come on, let y'all help me this morning. Amen. If you want your life to be fruitful, you have to get rid of all the filth and evil in your life. Amen. If you want your life to be spiritually productive, you have to humbly accept the engrafted word of God. The Bible says in Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. Blessed are the pure. If you want to see God, you got to work. You got to let God help you get your heart right. Are y'all hearing me out there? And if we'll get our heart right, we're going to see a great harvest in our life. We're going to see a great spiritual harvest in our life. If you don't like the harvest you're experiencing right now, just let God help you get your soil right. Amen? Number two, the second secret to living a spiritually productive life is you got to cling to the Word of God. And that's what he says there. He says, and the seeds that fell on good soil represents honest, good-hearted people 
who hear God's word and cling to it. To spirit, to be spiritually productive, you can't have this nonchalant thing about the word of God. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You got to cling to it. Amen. If you want to live a fruitful life, the word of God has to have an important part of your life. You know, listen, before I got saved, I went to church, but I had a lot of religion. I just go to church and I just went through the calisthenics of Christianity. Folks, you're not going to live a spiritually productive life by going through the calisthenics of Christianity. It's got to get beyond surface. It's got to be real. It's got to be sincere. It's got to be relationship. It's got to, you got to fall in love with the Lord. You got to desire. Come on. Are y'all hearing me out there? You got it. You got to want the word of God. You know, listen, clinging to the word of God means you hold fast to it and you don't let it go. You keep it in your spirit. You keep it in your heart. You know, when I worked in the oil field, one of the things that I dreaded doing was we'd go out in a boat sometimes when the weather was too bad to fly. And we would go out there in a boat or we were on one platform, had to go to another platform and we had to swing off the boat to the platform. Some of you have been there. And so you're on the back of the boat and they got a rope hanging on the rig and they swing it to you and you catch the rope and the boat's doing this. And so you're hanging on to the rope and you got to swing off of that boat onto the rig and you see those waves crashing against the platform and it's like they got hands and they say, come here, I want you. And you know, like when you swing off of that, you better hold on, baby, because if you let go, you're done. You got to cling to that rope like your life depends on it. And I think that's what God is saying. You got to cling on to the word of God like your life depends on it because it really does. Amen. You know, during this whole coronavirus thing, the very thing that brought me peace in my life is knowing God's got a plan. And when you know his plan, you're not worried about what the what's happening in Washington, D.C., or the United Nations, or the worlds around us, you know that they got to take second seat to the plan of God. And you hold on to the word of God. And whenever the winds are fighting and blowing, you hold on to the promise of God, and you're going to be okay. Amen. So we need to learn to trust God's word. We need to cling to God's word, cling to the promises of the word of God. I love Deuteronomy 31, 8. The Lord is the one who goes ahead of you. He will be with you. He will not fail you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. But what about if we go through the coronavirus? He said, hold on to the word. Come on, I'm going to see about it that you get through this. Come on, come on, come on. I love Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. The word of God holds me steady. Amen. You got to declare the word of God over your life. You know, I love Job 22, 28. You will declare a thing and it will be established for you and light will shine on your ways. You see, listen, whenever you feel like you're transitioning, when you're going through this, the, the, turmoil, whenever you feel like you're in the seas of life and you're like on a boat, you're going up and down and you got to go from this place to that place. And the only thing you have is a rope. You just hold on to the rope of the word of God and he's going to get you from the boat to the platform. He's going to get you from instability to stability. He's going to get you from defeat to, to, to victory, victory. Amen. Hang on, declare the word of God. Amen. I love Philippians declare truth in God's word. Philippians 4, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, not some things. I can do all things. I can get through anything. It doesn't matter what I face. It doesn't matter what I go through. I'm going to get through it. Amen. I love 419 and my God will supply all of my needs according to his riches in Christ. All of my needs, every need. The Lord is going to see about it. He's going to take care of me. Amen. Amen. Pardon me while I just preach myself happy here. The word of God is so important. And you see, if you live in your Christian life and the word of God is not a central part of your life, you're missing out. And you're going to find yourself unproductive. And you know what I found that you can live the casual Christian life, the, you know, just the 
calisthenics of Christianity, but you're not going to be productive. But if you will just allow the Word of God to just put value in the Word and say, Lord, I want to do what your Word tells me. I want to follow the truth, the commandments of God. If you begin to follow the truth and the direction and the leadership of the Word of God, my friends, you're going to be blessed and you're going to be victorious and you're going to love what God does in your life. Amen. The third secret to living a spiritually productive life is learn to be patient. Yeah, you, you didn't, I didn't mince words. You got to be patient. Again, Luke 8, 15, and the seed that fell on good soil represents honest, good-hearted people who hear God's word. They cling to it and patiently produce a huge harvest. See, the harvest of fruitfulness doesn't come overnight. You know, you can't pray and say, Lord, would you help me and expect in five seconds for everything to just work out? Sometimes the Lord will do that. But in my case, most of the time I have to walk through it. Amen. And, you know, I've seen people time and time again, they go through the most horrendous things in their life. And if they'll just patiently hold on to the Lord, they'll see their life get back on track. And you know, listen, if we're patient, we're going to reap a huge harvest. You know, I had a friend that gave me some tomato plants this spring. And I planted them in the ground. And I went back the next day, and do you know there was no tomatoes on them plants? No, they weren't. It's like, what kind of tomato plants are these? But you know what? It took weeks and weeks. I had to patiently water them plants and prune them plants and water them plants and water them plants and tie them plants up and be patient and be patient. And it wasn't till weeks later. In fact, I kept looking at, is there, I see flowers. Is there going to be any tomatoes? Like the nice plants, man, they're pretty. Where's the tomatoes? I don't like leaves. I want tomatoes. And then all of a sudden, the tomatoes started. And now, like, Tanya, she harvested tomatoes last night. And there was an abundance. But it didn't happen overnight. And we have to learn to be patient. And sometimes in our impatience, we say, Lord, if you're not going to work it out, I'm going to work it out. If you're not going to do it, I'm going to make it happen. you got to be patient, my friends. You got to wait on the Lord. Amen. We have to learn to, to wait. How do you develop patience? First of all, you got to learn to rely on the Holy Spirit. See, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, and patience. And so, you know, what I find patience is the fruit of the Spirit that comes when I learn to rely on and depend on the Holy Spirit. If you need more patience, spend more time in the presence of God. And the fruit of patience is going to start working into your life. Come on. I'm trying to encourage you today. Amen. And just hang in there. Tomatoes are coming. Amen. And then the other thing is you have to exercise your faith and trust God. You got to exercise your faith. Look, Hebrews 6, 12 says, we don't want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Notice what it says. It's not just with patience. It's patience in faith. See, faith gives you the strength to wait on him. And so we need faith, which means I trust you, Lord. I know you're going to help me, Lord. I know you're not going to abandon me, Lord. I know you're not going to forsake me, Lord. I know you are well aware of what's happening in the United States of America right now. I know, Lord, that you know my circumstances and you know what I'm going through and you know what I'm dealing with. But, Lord, I'm going to trust you because I know you're going to get me through it. Amen. We have to continue to trust in the Lord while we're waiting for the harvest. If you take a tomato plant and you plant it and you wait a week for tomatoes and they don't come and you go dig up that tomato plant, 
and you go plant it somewhere else because, man, this soil is not working, you'll never have tomatoes. you got to wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. God wants us to be fruit producers. He wants us to be productive. When he talked about the four seeds, I'm not sure he said only 25% is going to be productive, but I know he said there's some barriers that you've got to overcome if you're going to live a spiritually productive life. Amen? And I know God wants us to be productive. So would you bow your head with me for just a moment? You know, everything that Jesus talked about in this parable all began with that first seed. And he said, the seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and they don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. And really what that means is they never do become a Christian. They hear the message but they never surrender their life. They never surrender their heart to the Lord. And none of God's principles work in your life until you first surrender your life to Him. Then His power, His presence, His principles begin to work in your life. If you're here today and you've never surrendered your life, you've never asked the Lord to forgive you, or you may be here and you're, you know what, honestly, you're backslidden. You used to be serving God, but right now, you're not serving God. If you were honest with yourself, you're not living your life for the Lord. And today, the Lord's saying, it's time to come home. It's time to come back. If you're one of those two people, I want to pray for you. But you have to first Be honest enough to acknowledge it. And if that's you, would you just do me a favor with everybody else's head bowed? Would you just lift your hand and say, Todd, pray for me today. I feel like the Lord is speaking to me. Just raise your hand and just hold it up for just, thank you, sir. I see your hand. Sir, I see your hand back here. Thank you. Are you saying, man, I need to come back to the Lord. I've drifted away. Man, I'm not where I need to be with the Lord right now. And I need to come home. Just just lift your hand. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. I see your hand. Now listen, we're going to pray together as a family. You just pray this prayer from your heart in sincerity. And say, Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. Lord, I'm sorry. Today I repent. I ask you to forgive me. I want my life to change. I want to live my life for you. Thank you, Father, for forgiving me, for accepting me, and giving me a fresh start. I love you, Lord, and I want to serve you. I want to live my life for you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. For those of you that prayed that prayer, I just want to thank you for being courageous. I encourage you to follow through. There's a card in the pew that says, I made a decision. If you want to fill that out, bring it to the, the desk in the lobby. We have some, a Bible and some gifts for you, something to help you get started. We're not going to harass you, but we want to encourage you because it's the greatest decision you could ever make. Amen. Now, would you do me a favor and stand with me? Before we go this morning, as I was preparing this message, I thought about those of you that are spiritually weary, that you've been waiting for the tomatoes for a while and you're getting weary. The Bible says, don't grow weary in well-doing for you shall reap if you faint not. Listen, there are times and seasons you go through spiritually where it seems like the heaven is closed and God forgot you existed, but He hasn't. He hasn't forgot you existed. Just hang on. Wait on the Lord. Keep your heart right. He's going to come through for you. He's not a God that should lie, nor that he should repent. If he said it, he's going to do it. And he's going to come and help you. Amen. And then I, I was thinking about those who are just 
just mentally, physically, emotionally exhausted through the stress that we've been going through. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. God wants to strengthen you today. God wants to encourage you today. You know, have you ever wore something very heavy, a heavy coat or something, or you had something very heavy that you were carrying and you finally were able to get it off of you and you go, oh my goodness. That's what the Lord wants to do for you this morning. Come on, if that's you, I want you to just lift your hands with me right now. And I want to pray for you. I want to pray the grace of God upon you. I want you to just begin declaring the love of God. The, Lord, I declare your favor is with me. Your blessing is upon me. Lord, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm not cursed, Lord. Lord God, I, Lord, I, I know that you are for me and you're not against me. Lord, I know that you can lighten my load and that, God, you can strengthen my heart and strengthen my life. And I pray for you for every person that's got their hands lifted. Lord, that is weary and tired and exhausted, I pray an infusion of your grace. I pray for an infusion of your power and your presence today. Thank you, Lord God, that Lord, you're moving on the hearts and lives of every person in here. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They that trust in the Lord shall renew their strength. They that hope in the Lord shall renew their strength. Thank you, Lord, for the strength of God that is coming upon the people of God. Lord, we thank you that we're victorious, that we're prosperous, that we're blessed, that we're favored. Thank you, Lord God, that we are on your team and we live victoriously. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody that agreed shouted and said amen. Come on, give the Lord a good praise. Give Him a good shout. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. We bless you, Lord. Praise you, Father God. Well, I just hope and I just have faith to believe that you just took a, a breath from God this morning. And you got a fresh uh, breath of encouragement in your lungs today. Amen? Amen. Well, listen, don't forget, today is Father's Day. And I want to encourage you to reach out to your dad if he's still here, because there will be a day when he won't be. Reach out to your spiritual fathers, send them a text, give them a call, encourage them. Let's make dads a special day today. Amen. Happy Father's Day once again to all our fathers. God bless you. You're, you're dismissed. Have a great day.